So today, I'm gonna take a look at Dr. Snaps. Yeah. Wow, Dr. Snap. There we go. That's right, Dr. Snaps and manipulation under anesthesia. Listen up everybody, I have some news. Hey interns, I'm Dr. Chris Rayner and I am not your everyday ortho. I teach you about injuries, orthopedic surgery, and medical topics in a way that's entertaining and easy to understand. Today, I decided that I'm gonna take a look at some videos from another chiropractor, Dr. Snaps. Now, it's Canada Day here. So I was planning on chilling today. However, you guys keep sending these videos to me on TikTok and Instagram, so I figured that I have to take a look and see what's up. I know that this is a topic of interest for you guys right now because I see that my colleague, Dr. Antonio Webb, recently made a video about this. I also checked out Dr. Snap's TikTok page and you can see that he is really blowing up right now. So I guess I'm gonna bite and see what all the freaking fuss is about. Stick around to the end to hear my takeaway safety tips for you. So who is Dr. Snaps? Dr. Snap! And what is manipulation under anesthesia? Yeah. Dr. Snaps is a Los Angeles based chiropractor who treats athletes in the general population. I'm not entirely sure yet whether the name Dr. Snaps comes from the fact that he is snapping people's spines left, right, and center, or from the fact that he snaps his fingers every time that he does a manipulation. But you can find him on TikTok or on IG under that name. I think his real name is Dr. Manasseh. A manipulation under anesthesia is a procedure that surgeons or physicians generally perform in a surgical suite with the assistance of an anesthesia doctor. It is a procedure that is sometimes necessary to restore movement to a joint that has become stiff after surgery or an injury. During this procedure, the anesthesia physician gives the patient sedation so that they will not respond to stimulus. Often, but not always, the anesthesia doctor will also give the patient a muscle relaxant so that they are more mobile and more easily manipulated. Once the patient is suitably sedated, and adequately relaxed, the physician or surgeon will perform a manipulation of the affected joint where they will gently move the joint past the block that was previously limiting its motion. This procedure allows patients to achieve positions and movements that were previously restricted by pain symptoms without the patient having to experience the pain that would be necessary to allow them to get there. It is different than a reduction where we are setting a displaced fracture or a dislocation and restoring it back to its anatomic position. But that being said, let's get right to it. The first thing that I have to say about this is that I am actually surprised that this is a thing uh, and that chiropractors are allowed to do this. When someone first sent me a video of this, I thought that it was a sports medicine physician that was doing this because I didn't think that chiropractors had hospital privileges that would allow them to have access to the OR. To be honest, it was difficult to know what Dr. Snap's qualifications are because he refers to himself as a sports medicine provider and does not clarify whether he is a physician or a chiropractor in his social media content or on his website. But Antonio Webb noted that he was a chiropractor and after some more searching, I saw that he studied at a chiropractic college, so I'm gonna go with that. If you know of a chiropractor that has access to the OR like this, let me know because in Canada, I have not seen this in any hospital where I have worked. Having said that, it is the job of the anesthesia physician to keep the patient stable while under anesthesia, comfortable and not experiencing pain, and to wake the patient from anesthesia once the procedure is done. Right here, rotation, right there. Wow. Yes. Now the usual situation where we use manipulation under anesthesia is when patients become stiff after surgery or an injury and have pain symptoms that prevent them from doing the movements that are required to properly rehabilitate themselves. The reason why we sedate the patients is so that we can have them relaxed and so that we can avoid their protective guarding reflex that would stop them from moving into the range of motion that would be painful. When they're sedated, they are unable to protect themselves because they have no awareness of the pain. This means that we are able to move them where we want to. This can include beyond where it is safe to move the joint since they have no ability to protect themselves. In fact, we have to be very cautious to avoid breaking bones or causing further injuries because of this. Usually, when we perform these movements, we do them slowly over a period of 15 to 20 minutes to avoid injury, since rapid movements are more likely to cause fractures or dislocations. With the manipulation of the cervical spine under anesthesia, I have a real concern that there is significant risk of injury because the patient has no awareness of what is happening and their ability to protect themselves has been removed. There is nothing to stop the chiropractor from performing an excessive movement and there would be no feedback to indicate that a problem had occurred. Additionally, the manipulation demonstrated here combines movements that are generally not desirable to occur together. Placing the neck in extension, 
positions the vertebral spines closer together. Rotating the cervical spine in this position could cause an injury if the vertebral spines impinged upon one another. I am generally not a fan of high velocity, low amplitude manipulations of the neck, but combining them with general anesthesia is very risky in my opinion. Now chiropractors will be quick to point out that there are not a bunch of studies that show that this is dangerous or that people have suffered serious injuries from this procedure. However, likewise, there are not any studies that show that this technique offers more benefit over standard techniques. In fact, the chiropractic literature states that there is little support for the efficacy of this technique and that there is little consensus for indications for its use. That's coming from the chiropractic literature, yo. Basically, that's chiropractors studying chiropractic stuff. Rotation and extension were a bad enough combination of movements to do at the same time. I mentioned that above. Adding lateral flexion to the mix is just ratcheting up the danger quotient to another level. And listening to Dr. Snap's call out vertebral anatomy that he believes that he is adjusting makes me feel like I am watching a trick shot pool competition or something. This is the Cody Thai combo truss shot. While it is one thing to be able to palpate bony anatomy and have an idea of where you are touching, it is entirely another thing to be able to manipulate the articulations between various vertebrae with the precision that you believe. There is no objective way to prove or corroborate what you have done. You can call out anything with confidence, but you know that there is no way for anyone to disprove what you have said. Convenient. Tackling a level 15 ulcer in the sacroiliac joint, which has been disguising itself as a zit for about 12 years now. So Luigi, I'm gonna have to have you hold tight for me on a one, two, one, two. But that also means that there is no way to prove what you have done either. To be honest, I'm not sure whether you actually think that you have manipulated the levels that you are calling or whether you are just calling out anatomical landmarks, but I would call that largely showmanship for the social media audience. Manipulation under anesthesia is not a typical first line procedure. It is used when patients fail more conservative means of treatment in an office setting. This means that patients who undergo manipulation have already experienced problems with their initial treatment and have not had results that were optimal. Quite often these patients have muscle spasm or soft tissue adhesions that may limit their movements and cause them pain. While it is possible to manipulate these patients in any positions while they are sedated, it doesn't mean that you should. Manipulation under anesthesia is a salvage or secondary procedure because it has a higher risk profile and lower success rate than other treatments. In a very short period of time, the practitioner will move the patient into positions that were not attainable for some time prior to. As a result, immediately after the treatment, the soft tissue structures are going to be irritated and inflamed. So, although you were able to obtain an increased range of motion, you have only done so temporarily for the short term and at the cost of causing additional irritation of the structures that impeded the range of motion in the first place. If lucky, the patient will start moving the affected joint immediately and work to maintain the range of motion achieved during the manipulation. But if not, the irritation and inflammation that always follows the manipulation under anesthesia will restrict the range of motion again in relatively short order. I always cringe if someone requests a manipulation or if I think that I might have to do one on a patient. It's not that it is hard to get the movement, it is what comes after the manipulation that is a problem. Five, two, one. All right. Oh, God. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate it. Thank you. Now, I know that the chiropractors and the chiropractic fanboys are gonna pipe up in the comments. You don't know what you're talking about, do you? But it is not possible to manipulate the vertebrae with the precision that you claim with such gross, rapid movements. Dr. Stuart McGill, well-respected biomechanist who has studied the spine for over 30 years, talks about the precision that is required to determine problematic areas in awake patients, stating that it is like being able to detect a single human hair under several pages of the phone book. If I can get a phone book and I'm gonna pull out a mustache hair and I'm gonna place a, that hair under the first page of the phone book. I want you to find the hair because if you can't, you have no ability to feel a little twinge caused by back pain. 
that you didn't have to ask them if they had pain. You saw it in their eyebrow and you saw it, you felt that motor unit fire, like, ah, just that little grab. Now go to two pages under the phone book. Now go to three. Now we're getting to the level of perception. The perception of problems in sedated patients who were relaxed and unresponsive would be even more difficult. This chiropractor's ability to determine problematic areas in awake patients is already challenging. Locating and selectively treating specific levels with gross manipulations such as shown is completely suspect. Ooh, one and occiput. I'm gonna get the one and occiput at the same time. He doesn't like it. See him going, hmm? Let me get this one. Let me get this one first. Right there. Then occiput, just let the shoulder down. I'm gonna get his occiput and his C1. This is gonna be a little bit loud. Mm. Woo! <laughs> nice, thank you, Doc. Appreciate you, man. Thanks so yes, much for everything. Mmm, for that? Two. One, right there, one. Let's get this S, let's get CT junction right there. I'm calling both. The muscles of the cervical spine traverse a number of spinal segments. So manipulation and stretching of these muscles is going to give you relief throughout the cervical spine. In addition, there are seven intervertebral and 14 facet articulations in the cervical spine. I highly doubt that a chiropractor or anyone can selectively detect or treat individual levels with any accuracy. I do think that it is possible to target the upper cervical spine versus the lower cervical spine, but I do not think that further specificity is possible. Of course, we cannot objectively test to see the accuracy of the manipulations and whether they match your intentions. So for me, this is all parlor trickery and theatrics. Are you doing something? Probably. Is it what you think? Probably not. SI joint right there. The SI joint is a synovial joint that joins the pelvis to the spine. The articulation is oriented front to back and it allows a small amount of rotation and translation in the sagittal plane. It is stabilized with very strong ligaments both front and back. Only small movements are possible at the SI joint. The manipulation that is shown here is more likely to elicit movement at the lumbosacral junction than it is at the SI joint because you really haven't stabilized the opposite hemipelvis or isolated it away from the lumbar spine. The ligamentous stabilization of the SI joint is much more robust than at the lumbosacral junction because of the degree of movement which is allowed to happen there. It's much less at the SI joint so it's much more stable. When you move the side of the pelvis that you're working on, the movement occurs at the point of least resistance, which for the reasons that I mentioned above is going to be the lumbar spine. I don't have to be a chiropractor to see this. I just have to have an understanding of anatomy of the pelvis and the lumbar spine to determine how the body will move. SI joint, not buying it. Palpating here, this is the SI joint. This is out of five, out of four, and out of three. Right. Here the chiropractor is doing a manipulation of the L5, L4, and L3 levels in much the same way that he manipulated the SI joint in the previous example. This makes me wonder, is your adjustment all that specific or are you just calling out random levels? Again, SI joint right above it is L5 and L4. I'm gonna get L5 and the SI joint, they go together. For those who know about adjusting, I'm gonna get the ischial two. I'm gonna go all the way down. This is what we call S to I movement, real quick. Ooh, bingo! <laughs> <laughs> wow, you make it look so easy. So easy, right? Yeah, but I know it's not. <laughs> In this case, Dr. Snaps is performing what he calls an S to I movement where he manipulates L5 and the SI joint together. He adds in the ischium for good measure. Now, he performs a manipulation that is similar to what he performed in the last two examples, but here he states that it is effective for two joints that are oriented perpendicular to one another and for a bone that forms a part of the pelvis. It makes me think that the techniques demonstrated are largely non-specific. While one can argue whether or not an SI joint manipulation is warranted, it is nonsensical that you should try to manipulate the ischium. It is a bone, not a joint. It does not require manipulation. Of course, 
I could have just misunderstood what you said, but there really wasn't a reason to bring the ischium into it, was there? Unnecessary anatomy speak. So we got L4, L5, SI joint, three and one. Three and one. Yeah, more of the same. More of the same. As a sports medicine surgeon who specializes in arthroscopic shoulder surgery, I spend a lot of my time assessing shoulder injuries and performing shoulder surgeries on patients that have suffered shoulder injury. Here, Dr. Snaps performs a high velocity shoulder distraction manipulation in a patient that presumably has shoulder stiffness or shoulder pain. I don't know. Two injuries that I often perform surgery for are shoulder dislocations or slap tears. Both of these injuries can occur in awake patients when their arm is suddenly distracted away from their body in either forward elevation or abduction. This type of high velocity distraction movement that was performed here is dangerous and more likely to lead to an injury than not. Physicians generally don't reduce fractures or dislocations in this manner to avoid further injury from our technique. And we certainly don't do manipulations in this manner either for the same reason. The fanboys can pipe down because while chiropractors and orthopedic surgery are two different professions, there is only one human anatomy and joints don't make a conscious choice not to be injured because a chiropractor is doing the manipulation. Now this isn't a manipulation under anesthesia, but I add it to illustrate my last point. The most common arm position that results in an anterior dislocation of the shoulder is combined abduction and external rotation of the shoulder. I say again, the most common arm position that results in an anterior dislocation of the shoulder is combined abduction and external rotation of the shoulder. Look at the size of Dr. Snaps compared to the patient. If this isn't an accident waiting to happen, then I don't know what is. Enough said. So what are my takeaway points for you? The manipulation under anesthesia is not a panacea. It has increased risks and increased complications. So it's really not the easy way out and you should remember that. The manipulation under anesthesia or MUA is also a salvage procedure. And this just means that all other means or all other measures of treatment have failed. Your response to treatment so far has been suboptimal and this is why it has been recommended. If you've been receiving treatment by a practitioner and you've not shown significant improvement after a time period of approximately six weeks, which is about the time frame of the natural history of the recovery of non-surgical mechanical neck or back pain, then you should consider trying something else before you move on to a MUA or a manipulation under anesthesia. And remember that a MUA is always, always followed by irritation and inflammation. So if you have to have it, be sure to move right away after you have had it and keep moving. And secondly, if your pain symptoms are significantly increased afterwards, or you have any numbness and tingling, or weakness in your motor function, or loss of sensory function, then you need to immediately go seek medical attention because this could be a sign that something serious has occurred. And if you've been to a practitioner and a MUA has been suggested, but you haven't been shown a progressive exercise program to correct the deficits that are causing the pain that you are experiencing, you need to go see somebody else and quickly go do that. And finally, anybody, any chiropractor or any practitioner that offers a MUA to you as a first line treatment of your symptoms, you need to walk away and do that quickly. So those are my thoughts on Dr. Snaps and manipulation under anesthesia. Thanks for watching. I will see you for rounds next week. And as always, that's been a word from Dr. Chris, not your everyday ortho. Just a flesh wound.